Old Testament reading for this Sunday is from Daniel chapter 7. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading for this Sunday is from Jude, the first chapter. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others, Show mercy, mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise to the reading of the Holy Ghost. Holy Gospel for Christ the King Sunday is taken from the Gospel of St. John, the 18th chapter. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the King of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king, then, said Jesus answered, You are right in saying that I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. In the church calendar, as it was noted, that uh, there's a couple ways that this Sunday can be celebrated. One is as the last of the church year. It's the Sunday of the fulfillment of uh, the promises of Christ's return and his establishment of the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, but related to that and actually connected to that is also uh, the possibility of celebrating as Christ the King Sunday. And that concept of Christ as king, uh, although it is one of many metaphors in the Holy Scriptures that use to explain who Jesus is and what he's done, it's an important one. Um, it is one that shows that he is ruling and reigning and all things ultimately belong to him. And uh, that's important to remember uh, as we are, as I mentioned earlier in the bulletin, waiting for our king of the kings to return. That uh, And... Uh, to make visible what is now true in heaven. The, uh, in, our, in the Lord's Prayer, the prayer our Lord himself taught us, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Notice, thy kingdom come. There's an aspect of the kingdom of which we are still waiting, but then we say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that there is a recognition that Christ already rules. Lutherans have traditionally made this point by uh, distinguishing between a threefold kingdom of God. Um, the ultimate end one, of course, is the kingdom of uh, 
glory when Christ returns. Probably when we, when we pray thy kingdom come, we probably most have in mind. Lord, come and reestablish everything. Re, bring back and undo the results of the, of the fall and bring back your good cre uh, creative purposes uh, in uh, why you created in the first place. Uh, but then also the kingdom of grace is what is his kingdom now as he's ruling and reigning in the hearts of his people through word and sacrament. And then there's an aspect we call the kingdom of power, which is the first of the kingdoms, which is how he rules, uh, whether we know it or not, but he does rule over all things. This would be, for example, uh, the book of Hebrews that says that by his almighty word, he preserves all things. In other words, things continue to go on because Jesus says so. The world continues to turn because Jesus says so. In other words, it's acknowledgement that he is also the creator and sustainer of all things. Now, this kingdom of power, even though it's on scene, is true. We, we get glimpses of it in the fact that uh, we say when uh, things go south, so to speak, that they're acts of God. And so in a sense, that's true. I make the point that whenever we see uh, something that uh, shows the fall, that this has also been a foretaste of hell. In other words, uh, God gives little glimpses of what it's like when he's not in your corner. And, uh, and those, on the other hand, remind us that, on the opposite side, that what it is like when he is in our corner. Uh, things that we see and admire in creation. Uh, the sunset, beautiful landscapes. The fact I mentioned in Bible class today that uh, as human beings, we are really fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, made the point that, um, you know, we can read... Uh, uh, license plates, and they don't have all the letters, but we know what they mean, right? We fill in the blanks. So, uh, the kingdom of power, God ruling, Christ ruling in this way, uh, not only seen, but with his power, his almighty power, uh, it cannot be resisted. When we talk about the kingdom of grace, back and going backwards now, kingdom of grace is that he rules in the hearts and minds of his people through word and sacrament, and he rules through means. He rules through means. Uh, I said, word and sacrament. And in this kingdom and this coming, he can indeed, and often is, unfortunately, resist. Uh, one can say no to the king in this way, that he does not rule in your heart. Uh, this, of course, uh, reminds us, too, of our need and our the commissioning our Lord has given us to bring his kingdom to others. When we pray that kingdom come, we're not just praying about the end, but, but also that it would king come to others, that we would then be his means. As he uses means, words, and sacrament, so he needs ways of uh, giving that word and sacrament out. And that can be in the public worship. We support uh, the worship in public houses like this, where his word and sacrament is going on, and, being, and, and this is where he's achieving his purpose of his kingdom coming and being expanded into people's lives and hearts. But we also do it in our private lives when we speak the word of God to our neighbor or to our family members when we teach them uh, the catechism and these sort of things at home. Uh, this is all part of the kingdom of grace. It comes through these means that God himself has established uh, to rule in the hearts and minds of people. Of course, now we long for in the last uh, the last few Sundays are pointing forward also then to uh, the kingdom of glory. And uh, just as in the kingdom of power, we don't always see it. In the kingdom of grace, it's hidden under word and sacrament. It doesn't always appear that God is winning and ruling, but he is. But the kingdom of glory is when Christ returns and what, how he rules and reigns will be visible to everyone. Everyone will see it and know it. Everyone will experience it. All eyes will see it. All knees will bow. All tongues will confess uh, that Christ is Lord. Uh, I was reading a quote from uh, Francis Pieper the other day. He says, there are no atheists in hell. <laughs> what does he mean by that? He means those people who are in hell will no longer believe there is no God. Um, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess the Lord. Uh, Jesus is making this point with Pilate, in fact, trying to, uh, in a sense, save Pilate. He says, Pilate, of course, responds when he talks about the truth. He says, what is truth, right? He, he brushes Jesus off. What is truth, right? Um, and, uh, and yet Jesus is 
trying to endeavoring to warn Pilate. Uh, this text here doesn't have it, but if you read in the other Gospels, it's clear that uh, when Pilate says, Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you? Jesus responds, You would have no power over me unless it were given to you from above. In other words, he's telling Pilate, Yes, you have authority, you have power. It has been given to you by my Father. Use it rightly. Use it correctly. A misuse will be damning for you. Um, and so, uh, Pilate's rejection of the truth is the rejection of Christ. Rejection of Christ. And it's probably good at this time, when we're looking at uh, these last and end times, to remember there's a whole bunch of different scenarios that are painted out there by different church bodies, uh, what this is going to look like when Christ returns. Uh, if you've heard, not heard of the word millennium, it means uh, it's based on the 20, uh, Revelation 20, uh, the thousand years that are mentioned there. There are what, and I can't go into every detail there, but there is what's called premillennialism. That's the, probably the most popular one today, that uh, uh, when Christ will come before the millennium and he will set up a thousand year reign. And generally the notion's connected with that of the thousand year reign are to give people a second chance, especially Israel. Okay? There is also what's called postmillennialism which believes that the church, and this is not very popular because it doesn't seem to be happening, and believes there's going to be this golden age that the church is going to create before Christ returns, and they think it's a thousand years literally too. Lutheran position is what's called amillennialism, which is probably an a improper way of referring. Amillennialism is not no millennium. And that's not quite exactly right. What it is, is maybe a better term is a realized millennium. In other words, we believe we've been in a thousand years for more than a thousand years. In other words, uh, what Revelation is talking about is the binding of Satan that he can no longer deceive the nations as he did at one time. What was the deception? Well, the gospel was very limited in the Old Testament, right? It was based upon Israel and her people and whoever came in contact with Israel, right? But in the New Testament, Christ says what? Go and make disciples of all nations. So now, Satan has been bound. Scripture refers to his being bound, the book of Revelation, through pictures. But Jesus uses the same thing when he says when he, about his ministry when he comes into the world that he, that you can't, he uses this imagery, you can't rob from a, the strong man in this house unless you first bind the strong man. So Jesus has bound the strong man. He's bound Satan. And you and I have been delivered from him. And so... Uh, in Christ's saving death and resurrection on our behalf, uh, he has bound Satan, and now the gospel message is going to all peoples of all nations. Uh, this is, a, a, again, I think the most, uh, the best way to interpret and understand these texts, because first of all, it does what? It places the texts that are most understandable, texts that are straightforward narrative in the gospels and in Paul's letters, and it uses those texts to interpret things like Daniel and Revelation, rather than the other way around. A lot of people want to, want to interpret Paul's letters and the Gospels on the basis of Revelation and Daniel. That's to put the uh, cart in front of the horse, to reverse the, the way it's supposed to be. Okay, uh, and so our and it's actually I would say this: it's a form of Gnosticism, really, if you think about it, because it's like. You have this special knowledge that you know because you understand Revelation and Daniel, even though it's all in picture language and symbolism. And you use that to interpret against the grain of what Paul says elsewhere, what our Lord says in the Gospel lessons. Uh, notice what our Lord says in John's Gospel we just heard a few moments ago. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. The notion of a millennium wants to make the kingdom of this world. Also notice this, Daniel 7, 13, the Old Testament lesson. It says, uh, one appeared before the Ancient of Days like a son of man. I wonder who that might possibly be. What was Jesus' favorite title for himself? The son of man, right? Okay, and it says, he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is for a thousand years. Nope. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. 
So the language here affirms what we're talking about, of uh, Christ's rule now. In fact, Jesus himself makes this point where he says what? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Not going to be given to me, has been given to me. And yet now he rules his church uh, in a hidden fashion. And for we do wait for, this is part of the now, not yet, we do wait for the full consummation of that salvation, which we will see when he comes. And yet he rules in our hearts and his minds through his word and sacrament. As he reminds us that the most significant event was his death upon the cross for you and for me, where he has paid for the sins of the entire world, for your sins and for mine. And it doesn't matter what race or tribe or nation or nationality, where you came from, how, how smart you are, or how, uh, how much money you have, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the King. Thanks be to God. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ always.